Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to Behind the Speculative Curtain, the true story of fighting Meltdown Inspector. Uh, my name is Art Mannion. I am the Vulnerability Analysis Technical Manager at the CERT Coordination Center, or the CERT CC, um, which is part of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. Um, for my own part, for CERT CC, we've been involved in coordinated vulnerability disclosure for nearly 30 years. Uh, I've been working in the field for 17 years, and we often play a role uh, coordinating, mediating, sharing vulnerability information, uh, coordinating activity between researchers and, and vendors, critical infrastructure defenders, uh, and other stakeholders. Um, hopefully this experience qualifies me well enough to handle uh, the panel here today. Um, it's uh, been a long, a long trip to get to this point. Um, I've got a great deal of respect for our panelists today and their willingness to talk about the disclosure processes that uh, went on behind um, Meltdown Inspector. Um, probably the most, uh, some of the most important vulnerabilities to have come out in the last decade uh, or longer, really, uh, in terms of scope and impact. Um, I also want to thank, uh, there's a handful of folks who helped us prepare for this panel, uh, but were not able to actually participate in the panel, so I want to thank them. Uh, and in case anyone changes your mind at the last minute, we do have a chair right here, so uh, anytime during the talk you feel like you're allowed to talk, please come up and, and join us. Um, a little bit of scoping before we get started. We're mainly talking about the initial set of uh, Meltdown Inspector disclosures from January 3rd, my, uh, supposed to be my easy week back from uh, after the holiday vacation. Um, we're not going to take questions from the room. Uh, we did, however, uh, ask Twitter to solicit questions. We've got a couple of questions from the Twitterverse that are integrated into, our, uh, into the questions for the panelists uh, today here. Um, and one of our goals here is that, that the folks in the room, the audience, security researchers, uh, vendors, other stakeholders, leave today with not only some more information about the Meltdown Inspector disclosures, um, but hopefully some practical advice uh, for handling these types of complicated disclosures if and when you are involved in them uh, yourselves. Okay, so without further introduction uh, and further ado, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, we've got uh, Matt Linton, Chaos Specialist at Google, Eric Dorr, General Manager uh, at MSRC, Microsoft Security Response Center, and Chris Robinson, but we call him Krobe, uh, Ambassador of Red Hat Product Security. Uh, welcome everyone and, and, and thanks. To get things started, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to uh, briefly introduce themselves further with any bio material I'd like to provide uh, and give us a relatively brief summary of uh, how the disclosures went at your organization. So, start with Matt. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt. I am a incident manager on Google's security and privacy incident management team, which is sort of a consolidated incident response and forensics team and PCERT. Um, and we handle really large issues that get brought to our attention. Um, the story at Google for Spectre and Meltdown begins with both uh, an act of brilliance and an act of extraordinary miscommunication, uh, which is, uh, you know, a real part of how incident response works. Um, so it begins in June when Jan Horn, building on research that others have done, uh, makes a big breakthrough and discovers uh, the speculative execution variants, which they call variant 1, 2, and 3. Uh, PZ does not like to name and brand vulnerabilities. And then... Project Zero does what Project Zero always does when they find a bug. They look for the actual owner of the bug, who can fix it, and they notify them. Um, and they feel very strongly in PZ about being consistent uh, about who they notify and, and, you know, kind of rebuffing criticisms that Project Zero gives Google early heads up of bugs and things. I assure you they do not. <laughs> uh, because they went to Intel and they notified Intel and the other CPU vendors of these spec exec vulnerabilities and they said, kind of third or fourth of the way through the email, they said, you know, we found these, here's our proof of concepts. By the way, we haven't told anyone else, including Google, about these. It's now your responsibility to tell anyone you need to tell. Um, and somewhere along the line, somebody missed that piece of the email when they read it. And so uh, what happened was the CPU vendors started the disclosure process, and they notified companies that needed to know. They notified Microsoft and, and others, and Somebody kind of went, well, of course you don't need to notify Google, dummy. They already know. They told us. Um, and so they, <laughs> as an incident responder, I found out about this uh, about midway through July, so 45 days-ish after they discovered it. And my team, when we were presented with something of this kind of scope, we declare what we call a black swan, uh, which is supposed to be a rare 
thing. I didn't actually look up black swans until much later and realized that they're not even endangered. There's like hundreds of thousands of them. <laughs> um, but we, we call it a black swan. So what we do is we follow a, an incident management process and we put an incident commander in charge and we gather some senior engineers, first from a small group to analyze the bug and see what the impact is and then slow, slowly bring in senior engineers from each of the other areas around Google, Android, Chrome, um, you know, Google Prod, the cloud team, et cetera. Um, and as we went, we're analyzing what's the impact going to be and how do we fix it, which turned out to be quite a problem. Uh, we asked Intel, you know, how do you fix this? And Intel was like, well, you know, funny you should ask. Maybe we should discuss it a little. Um, and we began discussing exactly how do you how do you fix these vulnerabilities? It was not at all evident and it was a really grim picture uh, for the first few months trying to figure this out. We collaborated with Intel. We struggled with it. For months, kind of, we would create a mitigation and they would shoot it down and then they would throw back a mitigation and we would shoot it down and uh, eventually it started to look pretty dire around the October time frame when uh, somebody reached out to us and said, you know what, I think we're all sitting together by ourselves trying to figure out how to fix this thing and I really think this is a bigger problem than any one company can fix by themselves and we need to get together. So an industry summit was formed, a bunch of the other people that Intel had notified got together and we started trading some recipes for fixes. We came up with um, some already existing code called Kaiser, right, an ASLR fix for Linux kernel that was presented before we even knew about speculative execution, but it just so happened to solve the meltdown issue. And so we got a group together to bring Kaiser and, and rebrand it KPTI into the kernel. Um, a Google engineer named Paul Turner came up with a really crazy concept for variant two called Retpoline, the return trampoline. And so we prepared some prototypes of that and some information to share back at this gathering of, of industry players. And it was about uh, late October when Microsoft came back to the group and said, this is all very good and messy but let's make it even messier uh, because nobody's talked about browser yet and we have a proof of concept that works in browser too. And we all said, seriously? Really? <laughs> You're going to do this now? Uh, and then we had to address browser. So um, on the Google end, we contacted the Chrome team and their story begins in October with a bunch of people coming to them and saying, by the way, here's a serious vulnerability that affects browser. We had senior engineers analyze it but we did not realize it was going to affect browser and you're getting notified wicked late. Right, so right. what do you do now? Um, shout out to the Chrome team because I'm still here today to talk to you. Um, and I met with one of their tech leads, uh, a guy named Chris Palmer and I said, do you have any ideas? And he said, well, there's this experimental thing we've been working on for a long time called site isolation and same origin isolation that would bring every website into a new process. And since Spectre Variant 1 is per process, you know, it would isolate everything to being able to only attack itself. And I said, how soon do you think you can be ready with site isolation? And Chris said, well, you know, I think with three to four quarters of work <laughs> is when we would be able to be comfortable going beta. And I said, okay, now Chris. <laughs> how soon do you think you can have it ready? And um, the Chrome team kind of turned on a dime. Everybody immediately started working their butts off day and night on the site isolation thing. They got it to beta by January, which props to the Chrome team for being able to turn around three quarters worth of work in like a month and a half and being willing to do it, both of those things. Um, so we get to about December time frame at Google and we have this weird trifecta of embargoness, wherein when Project Zero finds a bug and they disclose it to a vendor, Project Zero does not impose an embargo of any kind. They, they are ready to talk about the bug when you are, but they do offer the vendor the ability to ask Project Zero not to talk about it for a certain period of time. It's the 90 day embargo. And what this means is, there's a 90 day uh, embargo period but it's not owned necessarily by Project Zero, it's owned by the vendor. And so it's the vendor's secret to keep, in this case the CPU vendors. But there's also this uh, emergency provision in their disclosure policy which says, look, if it's obvious and clear that the vulnerability is now known to the public and we see a risk to users of exploitation, we reserve the right to still publish it even when you're not ready. 
Um, and so throughout November, December as industry speculation kind of grew and we started to see more and more people zeroing in on this mysterious set of patches that was getting mainlined by Linus and nobody was talking about. Um, and in fact Linus had not even insulted anybody over them. <laughs> Whoa! It went into upstream and nobody got called an idiot. This is weird. Um, few people got called an idiot. <laughs> Preciously few. Um, and then a slip by one of the people that uh, was submitting patches caused everybody in very late December uh, to totally ruin my New Year's. Um, and in January 3rd, six days before the planned embargo end date of January 9th, on January 3rd, we had watched the industry go from not knowing on December 29th to getting an inkling of knowing to totally knowing to having proof of concepts on January 2nd. And we came in on January 3rd and said, look, we like you CPU vendors, we know you really want to wait till the 9th, but there are proof of concepts. Users are now at risk, it is time to end this embargo. And so we pulled the ripcord on that emergency provision and we said we're going to disclose. And uh, we like panic notified our partners and said, I'm, you remember that whole ninth thing? And then I'll let them tell the rest of that part. Cool. Thank you, Matt. Microsoft Stern, please. So the story for us started in June as well. Uh, but, but you got to think about the, the, the January 3rd package all tied up with a bow, nothing confusing, <laughs> completely clear <laughs> what was going to happen to each environment. It didn't look like that in June. It was some brilliant research by, by Jan Horn uh, on Linux. And so here we are at Microsoft, we see this thing. Oh, you know, this looks, looks like a thing. Let's go see if it, you know, reproduces on Windows Server, start digging in. Oh wait, this looks legit. Uh, we don't have enough people to really put together the pox to prove or disprove this works. So let's pull in some other people from across the company, you know, ring, ring. Hey, we, we need to borrow one of your employees for, you know, like a couple of weeks maybe uh, to work on this thing. Oh, sure, no problem. You know, <laughs> some of them are still working uh, almost a year later. Well, I guess a year later. Uh, the, uh, and so we start, the, the, the process begins to unfold and understand the complexity and kind of it grows and oh, would it affect this product? And you go look at it, oh, yeah, yep, it affects that product, okay. Like, and you just kind of keep, keep peeling the onion and finding more complexity. Meanwhile, keep in mind in the summer, we didn't have an extension to the 90 day normal embargo. So we're thinking it's September, I've spaced the date, but September something was supposed to be uh, the, uh, the disclosure. And you know, a bunch of these changes that we're imagining are big changes that just, you can't land these changes in that time frame. So we're like, okay, we really should work on getting extension. We should assume the answer is going to be no. So we should work really hard on what we can do in that time frame. Uh, reasonably quickly we got the extension and <laughs> I remember thinking sometime in August, oh yeah, I mean, January is a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, so we keep working and, you know, we're working with the chip man manufacturers who are kind of controlling and passing information and figuring out who's in the tent and stuff like that. And, uh, and, and you know, we're working on this stuff and, and to me, one of the major milestones, and, and Matt touched on this, was when we, we all got together, we all, all the people, the small set of companies that were kind of in the know about the details of the vulnerability and actively working on fixing, uh, got together face to face in November. And, you know, it's, it, it's funny how rare that kind of a meeting is. And, uh, and a bunch of people, when we proposed doing this, pushed back. Inside of Microsoft, there was a bunch of pushback. Outside of you know some of the other partner companies, and the pushback was, oh, I mean, we don't do this. The legal arrangements are going to be hard. You know, just a bunch of stuff. And we said, look, this is hard. This is complicated. The dependencies are are confusing. You know, this. Let's try it. What's the worst that can happen? And so we worked through the legal agreements. We got in a room, and and honestly, I was blown away by the collaboration in the room. I mean, we had people. Uh, we'd done some research that we kind of went open kimono and shared that research broadly with those folks, including stuff we'd found that like the browser thing that, that other people had not yet. Uh, and, and it was a leap of faith to trust that, that that was the right thing to do to protect 
our shared customers and the broader ecosystem. I was blown away when, uh, when Paul stepped up and walked through Redpoline. Like, who shares mitigations with competitors? Like, in case you hadn't noticed, Google and Microsoft don't always get along, right? And uh, anyway, and, and to me that was kind of the, the turning point where it's not that it didn't stay hard after that, but it was a turning point where the collaboration went up in order of magnitude and, you know, we felt, I felt for the first time like we were really all pulling together towards a shared objective. Uh, the, you mentioned the Kaiser thing, you know, we, we ended up rewriting the memory manager in Windows and then backporting it, I don't know how many times, uh, over a couple of month period. And so we're, we thought, we can't just ship this, we have to, we have to flight this, we have to get hundreds of thousands of people using this, and people are going to notice this size of a change. So, you know, we, we all kind of, the people who were making major changes like that agreed. If anybody asked, we'd say, oh yeah, that Kaiser paper, super awesome. Like we were inspired, we made some changes. <laughs> Pretty thin cover story. I was a little surprised it lasted as long as it did. Uh, and you know, then takes us through January, the last couple of days are very similar to Matt's couple of days. But, but one thing that I, I thought was funny, and it was actually one of the titles um, that, I, uh, that we were considering for the submission for the talk, uh, in, in, a, in the week or two before disclosure, I had more text messages between some of the folks in these other companies working on this than I did with my wife. And, uh, and I thought that was kind of a little sad, um, but also <laughs> like profoundly cool that we had achieved that level of collaboration where we were really, we were just partners helping protect customers, so. I think I remember too, remember when they were, the, the case of the mysterious KPTI patches was published in LWN, like on Twitter people were like, yeah, okay, Linux is redoing memory, and then I think it was Alex Ionescu <laughs> was the one that noticed you'd rewritten Windows memory management, and then people were like, oh, no, no, Microsoft too, something's up, yep. you know. Right. And sorry, before we get to Crow, pardon me a moment, Eric, I want to pull on just, just one more thing. So June, this thing started off, there was, I imagine, email conversations between those in the tent, so to speak. I think you just said there was a in-person meeting later in the process and that was sort of at that point and further the collaboration was a, a different character mm. just to clarify that's right. yeah yeah that's right i mean the lots of i mean lots of good collaboration throughout but okay. to me it felt like the the we kind of formally transitioned from the kind of hub and spoke most communication flowing through hub and spoke to a lot more of yeah. the direct communication between yeah. people in the tent i think i would even say like up until then we were all afraid to talk to each other yeah. cuz you know, we need to know what each other know in order to actually fix this, but everybody's afraid as an engineer, like, oh no, somebody's gonna say this is, you know, bad that we're talking to each other. Microsoft and Google are competitors, they shouldn't work on a mitigation. Um, and then once we all got the permission to, to be engineers together in person, it's like, oh God, you know this, good, I know this, here's what we can do about it. Yeah. Right. So high bandwidth, high collaboration, yeah. flying people together to be there in person is a, is a real thing, a real yeah. technique, so good, thank you. Sorry, Krobe. Go for it. So my story is a little different. <laughs> in June, I had a delightful vacation. I was enjoying summer. We had a couple incidents to manage throughout the days. And I was commenting to my backup, uh, one of my program managers, wow, this August, it sure is busy. This is the busiest I've seen things around here in years. November, I was not invited to a meeting. <laughs> really? But on November, I think the end of the month, I got a, a phone call from one of my uh, chief engineers, and he said, you're going to get a phone call from Intel tomorrow. Like, well, why would Intel call me? <laughs> and then I, we were pulled into the tent, so to speak. Uh, so we started at the end of November, and uh, we, I will say that the collaboration that came before was very helpful, but we still had a substantial amount of work to do. Uh, our processes, um, you know, we, we sell free software, so our business model is a little different than Microsoft and even Google. Uh, we are a pure open source company. Everything we do, we are collaborating with people that aren't 
part of our organization. That's the open source way. It is very common for my en engineers from Red Hat to collaborate with people from SUSE or Canonical or Amazon or Google. Or it, it, we collaborate all the time. Nothing quite on this scale. Uh, that was uh, another thing that, that as I was getting briefed the meeting before the Intel meeting, that I was told this essentially affects every computer ever made. <laughs> it didn't affect the 486, though. It didn't affect the 486 or Itanium. I think Raspberry Pis were safe. Or <laughs> some of them were right. Uh, so that was a very a very shocking lead-in. You know, every computer ever made is broken, and what are we going to do? So we had we scrambled a lot, but we I had some very talented engineers that helped work with the, the Kaiser folks and help to uh, facilitate the integration into the open source community. Uh, fun fact, no one in open source likes to be told to do anything. <laughs> so if you say you are going to do Kaiser, their first instincts are to take a step back and get the frowny face out and then start telling you how stupid your idea is. Uh, so that took a little bit of, we were able to help facilitate some of these things. There's some great engineering work. We were able to help get that facilitated through the larger community. Uh, the cover story uh, was a godsend because that was where we were able to work with some of our OEM partners, uh, the, the system integrators that weren't necessarily read in, but they um, were given uh, microcode from Intel and we were going to, we gave them test patches, which I know that other organizations also worked with some of these folks to give them test patches. And that gave us some really good data, a much wider test sampling to understand how, what the performance impacts were going to be. And we were very concerned about um, breaking KBI. Uh, yeah, that would have been bad. But, uh, and then on the third, I was sitting there getting ready to uh, go, home, go home for the day. I work in my underground lair at home. And I was ready to go upstairs and have a delightful dinner when I got an exciting page and it said, uh, are you guys ready to go? <laughs> and I said, why would I be ready to go? <laughs> I have a full week to do my documentation finished and everything else. Like, oh no, dude, we're going in like an hour. Sorry. So, yada, 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 over the course of the next eight hours, I drank a half a bottle of Kraken while I watched our patches get pushed out to our content delivery network. <laughs> Good times. Well done, well done. <laughs> so thanks for, the, thanks for the start off there, everyone. Um, we've already touched on this topic a couple of times, but uh, I'm going to call it tent membership uh, since we've talked about that before. Um, you know, so the Google Project Zero has got their policy notified. The... Uh, people directly responsible for making fixes, so Intel, other chip vendors. Um, that spread to OS vendors. Uh, we've heard that Red Hat was a little later in that, in that schedule. And I also want to say, we had to push really hard. The, surprisingly enough, the chip manufacturers don't necessarily talk to each other really frequently. They don't like to share information. And there were, we worked very hard to try to get some collaboration or at least some information sharing because there were a couple uh, stakeholders that weren't included. And the same thing, I had to be very vocal to get other commercial Linux engaged as well because, you know, these folks, I participate, they help us develop the fixes. We all, it's a community to, it takes yeah. a village to do this stuff. So I, we had to push really hard to get extra people brought in. So that's an exactly what I want to push on a little bit. We've got, um, one of the Twitter questions is right in this, right in this department. So it's tent membership, who's included, when, at what point, how are those decisions made, what are those factors? Let me read it for the sake of, uh, honoring the person who did actually send us the, the Twitter question. So, uh, in a multi-party coordination effort at scale, is there a single layer of information shared, as in binary, you know or you don't know, or are there varying levels of detail provided? Upstream vendor knows full details, downstream knows some high-level details. Um, why is this due to known trust? And generally, again, the question is, what factors are considered when deciding whom to notify and when in advance of a public disclosure. So, Krob, do you wanna, have you finished up there or do you? I, I uh, so from our perspective, when a researcher comes to us, we ask to include people that are relevant to helping creating the fix or are you know, drastically affected. 
but that's our modus operandi is that if you can contribute, if you have a need to know and you can contribute to the solution, we would like to have you in. And I think subsequently, I think we all, and we'll get to that later, but yes, so if you need to, if you can, if you can add value, I feel we, you should be in there to help out. And there are different levels of disclosure because uh, it's very different if you are an engineer helping develop the fix versus someone that has a very large customer constituency of you know, millions of uh, machines. So I need that, their help for testing, but I don't necessarily need their help in crafting the solution. So I can't, I, they don't need to know all the dirty details. Uh, so uh, as we've already kind of talked about, I mean the, the the vulnerabilities were owned by the chip companies and so I think we all respected mm -hmm. that they ultimately had final call on who to, who to tell the details and how many you know, levels of, of detail there were. Um, there are certainly situations where there were conversations about should we involve so and so and, and you know, good back and forth and good collaboration on that. Uh, the, but I think one of the things that, that you got to keep in mind always when you're dealing with a vulnerability and man especially when it's multi-party and there's you know, a lot of complexity. The more people you add, the higher the likelihood of a leak. Yes. I mean, and it's honestly shocking to me that this stayed under wraps as much as it did for, you know, six plus months, uh, given there had to be thousands of people working on this across, across the industry. Now, uh, and uh, there's some uh, saying, who, I forget who said this, but the, you know, Three, three people can keep a secret if two of them are dead. And, you know, it's good to keep that in mind when you're thinking about who do you bring into a tent. Yeah. Sometimes I think even one person, like, if they're careless with their GitHub, like... <laughs> there. Um, Google, I guess, would have two perspectives on this because we're both a recipient of VRP reports and a producer of a large amount of them, um, depending on whether you're VRP or Project Zero. Um, you know, like I said earlier, it belongs to the chip makers, the embargo belongs to them, and you're, you either have someone who owns the embargo or you have nobody owning it. And if you try to have more than one person own it, you basically have nobody own it. So um, there were people that, you know, we personally, like I personally thought we should definitely have this other person in the tent, but, you know, the chip maker owns the embargo, so it's my job to advocate for those other people to push for why I think they need to be in the tent. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, if I don't do a good job of convincing the embargo owner to bring them into the tent, to accept that I did a good job and not ruin everything because sure. I didn't get my way, yeah. right, mm -hmm. as an incident manager. And so to that effect, um, you know, we had the embargo partners that we were able to convince the chip makers to bring into the room. And for the most part, I think we had the right people. Google tries to use an objective criteria for determining who to notify about a thing. And the objective criteria that we use is, are they a maintainer or a meaningful contributor to something that is necessary to get fixes out? And so in this case, um, around the table, where we consistently advocated for was, are you an OS maintainer, a virtualization stack maintainer, a chip designer, or do you write a kernel driver right, that interfaces with speculation in some way. And so we tried to include everyone that met those criteria and to not tr include people that don't meet that criteria in order to keep it from ballooning into a 40,000 person secret that's really one of those kind of open Oops. secrets, right? Okay. Nothing's worse than an open secret embargo because you're sort of doing embargo CPR. You're pretending that nobody knows and that's just, that's not helping users. We actually right? tried to do that recently at the, Third CC. It didn't embargo go very CPR? well. Yeah. yeah. And it, for a week. Yeah, uh, and it, you know, you get to a certain point with people CPR that you're not helping anymore too, and right. so um, that's the way we look at it. Okay, so I want to put a little bit of a finer point on this on this this tent. Um, um, in the United States, two congressional uh, committees from both houses have written letters to at least two of you, maybe all three. No, <laughs> just you guys. Yeah. No, Plus some other nope. folks, right? Uh, and one thing the time. yeah, one thing U.S. government is curious about is. Uh, why was the United States government not told, and why were Chinese companies told? And this is apparently uh, something, you know, something Congress is asking about and, and concerned about. Um, and to make it very personal for me, why did nobody call me? <laughs> Everyone in this involved knows me personally. <laughs> Before I get to lose it, right? Okay, yeah. so, um, 
I had, I had to, that was, that was it's all, not about that you, was it's my, about us, Art. I, <laughs> I accept, I take no for an answer very well. But, uh, so yeah, this question of, and we, we'll expand it beyond the US government, but I'm a government, I may be a large customer, I may have responsibilities to my population, critical infrastructure, public safety protection duties, uh, and governments are saying, hey, tell me about these things before they drop. Uh, U.S. government and others in, in particular. So should U.S. and other governments be included in the, in the tent, in the pre-public disclosures um, or notification? And if so, what, what might that look like? Or is the answer really, it's not a good idea? So. Um, yeah, I, I can go first on this one. I fielded one of those letters. Yep. Um, it's a really complicated piece of the puzzle, right? It goes back to can the entity that you're thinking about notifying contribute to fixes in a way that will meaningfully impact end users? Right. And one of the conversations that I had with some people from the, the committee that were asking the questions, they said, you know, why didn't we get early notification? And my response was, well, do you maintain an operating system kernel, a VM stack, or drivers? And they said, no, but there are things we could have done, right? We could have taken our virtualization workloads and split them by sensitivity levels so that we were virtualizing different levels of sensitivity. And my answer to that was, isn't that something you should already be doing? Because <laughs> this bug has lived for 20 years, and there is guaranteed to be out there right now some mega bug that Another we haven't one. discovered yep, yet. Yep. And you know what you're talking about are preparatory things you could have already been doing. And so I, I had an open challenge kind of on Twitter for a little while too. Someone please find me a thing that you could have done if you were early notified about Spectre and Meltdown, not as an OS maintainer virtualization stack, right? Um, find me something you could have done that's not already good preemptive practice for the next big bug that you don't sure. know about yet. Um, r respect to the, you know, blow up on Twitter about, well, why did you tell China and not the US government? Which I, I saw it phrased that way a lot. Sure. I kind of take exception to the way it's been phrased on Twitter. And, and I think it reflects a bias that we have in the Western world, right? That telling a Chinese company anything is de facto ch telling the Chinese government everything. And, you know, there, there's, there's a nuanced discussion that can be had there, but yes, Intel notified Lenovo because Lenovo was necessary for them right. to get microcode updates to millions or hundreds of millions of people. Um, I don't know whether Lenovo would turn around and tell the Chinese government that specifically, but if you seat yourself in a Chinese engineer's point of view, you have exactly as much evidence that telling Microsoft doesn't immediately go to the NSA right, right. as you do that telling Lenovo goes directly to the Chinese government. And you remember like early 2000s, there was the NSA key variable in a Windows debug and it was some meaningless debug signal but everybody thought it meant that the NSA had keys to Windows and um, it's all sp speculation, pun not intended. <laughs> and I, I think it goes back to if you can keep objective about the need to know parties being somebody who can effectively bring a fix to end users and secure people, um, then the question of who should be in the tent is solvable. It's not who you're going to emotionally want to be in the tent. I actually wanted to tell you. Oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> but I don't own the embargo. Fair enough. Um, incidentally, we compromised on CERT specifically where we were like, let's tell them a week before it goes public so that they at least know what to say. <laughs> Surprise. So you can Almost. thank, <laughs> Close. Yeah. you can thank Pone All The Things right. for developing a POC right. on January 1st. Because um, we would have told you the next day, promise. That's, yeah, sure. Oh. And <laughs> it was if on I, my list. If, if I can add. Can yeah. I Oh, please. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, so uh, I uh, was actually the signatory for some of these things for Lenovo. Uh, we operate our product security operations out of the U.S. We had uh, less than two dozen people uh, who were aware of what was going on. Uh, all but one were U.S. people, and that one other person was somebody in Japan we needed to lead some of the efforts for ThinkPad. So to answer the question, uh, no, we did not disclosed broadly, and it was all managed out of the U.S. under normal agreements with, with Intel and the same sort of things you guys did. No. And would you say you needed to know? Uh, so I did, leading the effort, so much like you guys, kind of kind of had to do that. Yeah. Uh, we came in late, uh, kind of like Crobe. Uh, I think uh, November 30th was when we found out, and it also made for uh, not a good holiday. Yeah. yeah. 
So, yes. thank you. No, thank you. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, and, and in a sense, I'm actually happy to not have known before because it would have wrecked the vacation. So. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sorry, Crobius. Oh, I was going to say, the, the attack is brilliant. Uh, the, kudos to all the researchers that found it. It's very creative. I'm stunned no one found it in 20, 40 years, whatever it was. But to put it in perspective, every year, my company alone, we push out 100 fixes for problems that are more severe than what Spectre and Meltdown right. were. Yeah. Spectre and Meltdown were only rated important on my scale, and we have a level above that. So we have, I have 100 issues every year that are more easier to manipulate and are more, not wide ranging, but are, um, have, have a lot greater potential for exposure, sure. as opposed to a, a, an academic exercise, something that it takes a lot of resources, a lot of time, and a highly skilled adversary. Right. So the likelihood of those attacks being executed are small, as opposed to you know, the dozens of other kernel CVEs we fix every year. So that's why I, 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 I don't tell anybody, I tell all the package maintainers and my partners about those issues, but I don't do pre-notification on any of those. So I don't know why I would do pre-notification on this. Right. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to go on record to say, I didn't say that we shouldn't tell Art. <laughs> 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 thank you. Thank you. I think thank you. Yeah, and, and you know, um, one of the players that I will say that I felt like met our criteria to notify are the BSDs. They maintain sure. an operating system. I, you know, that was an argument that we ended up not winning with the embargo owners. And again, my role is to, to advocate and then accept it, and then do the best I can with what I have. So. Um, we've talked a lot. We have a, you know, definitely a strong vendor perspective here, and, and, and vendors were really in charge of this, this uh, disclosure and, and, and ran the process. But um, uh, I'm kind of curious: from a, is there something from a security researcher perspective? Um, you know, the, the, is there any advice you would give a researcher as to what to do in a situation like this? Uh, again, realizing I know Google's got a research component, and I think so does Microsoft, and you guys may as well. You guys must find things by accident. The internet is my research lab. Sure, sure. So, but is there something from a researcher angle um, that a, a researcher may do differently or not do or consider uh, in case you found a, you know, internet-wide multi-vendor sort of bug and you're going to go talk to someone about it? Uh, any advice for the research community? I, I have feelings. Oh. You go first. Yeah, I'll just, sure. I, I think, <laughs> first, I think uh, it can be hard when you're a researcher. You don't always know who's the right, who. Who do you need to contact? Are you going to do a perfect job at it? So I think you know we have to be careful. We don't push too much of the burden on researchers. Get it right every time. You know. Right, right. That said, I'd say um, uh, two-way communication. So you know, if, if you think there's three companies that need to be informed, I would tell the first company that you're informing those three companies, and the second company you're informing those three companies. You know, and and I wouldn't hesitate to ask each company. Who, who else do you think needs to know? Who else are you going to include? And kind of the more, I think the more we can have researchers just be part of the process of working through, you know, how bad is the vulnerability? What's the right way to mitigate it? We all benefit. And so, you know, researchers can, can set the tone for that in how they engage. Okay. And we, we get a lot of, re again, I don't write software. I curate it. Uh, <laughs> I don't own it. So... In open source, I get a lot of researchers that'll come and come to us because we're widely known in open source, and they'll say, "I found this problem with X package. Do you know who to talk to about this?" So a lot of times we'll act as a liaison. I will pass along the contact information. We'll offer to broker the communication. Um, so if you're if you if a, you found an interesting problem and you don't know where to go. Uh, talk to someone you think is related and hopefully they will be able to help get you pointed the right way. And I think CERT, the CERT organization does a really good job of Thanks, kind of good. connecting the dots um, for everything. You know, we do a lot of open source, um, but you know, CERT is a great another organization you can light, lean on to get data, information. We like open, open source now too. Nice. <laughs> we, that's right. And we like you guys. <laughs> I know Matt's got some. And gals. Yes. Matt did say he had feelings. I so. have feelings. Yeah. He has some um, feels? Yeah, so... Uh, 80% of all the problems that I encounter with any kind of multi-party coordination, with any kind of incident response, is communications. I think Eric nailed it a little when he said, everybody needs to communicate better, not just the researchers. 
Um, but if you're reporting a bug as a researcher, and it's a good one, especially, um, you know, if you report it to one company and you've already reported it to others, just try to let everybody know who else knows because sometimes, you know, we'll get a report of something, I'll start a response working to it and then s the researcher will also report it to Android and then Android starts a response working to it and it's like we end up having to catch each other inside and re-collaborate um, and, and it ends up in wasted effort and wasted time. I would also say the researchers are doing the industry a huge, huge favor by finding bugs and giving them to us and letting us know and yes. the companies also have a responsibility to the researcher. We're experienced, we do this all the time, we have processes, when we communicate back to the researcher, you know, if I'm going to say something like, you know, thank you for this report, I've got a response going, I'm going to embargo this, they don't know why we're doing those things. We need to be coming back to them and saying, oh, this is great, if we don't have an embargo for the next two months, what's probably going to happen is we won't be able to ship Windows Server patches at, in time, but also if we notify, you know, Linux distro security, they're only going to keep it secret for two weeks. You sort of need to keep the researchers involved in the disclosure process so that they, they don't just feel like they're sending their research to an unappreciative black box. Mm -hmm. yeah, true. And, and so I think more communication between researcher and company in both directions is really necessary. Okay. And there's very few of them that know these processes. You know, that know right. that distros is a two week one and done. It's going public whether you want to or not. Yeah. They don't understand these. So it's our job as kind of a, a gatekeeper to help educate them and say, this is what we think you should do. These are the rules of this community. Mm -hmm. you know, you yeah. It's also our responsibility to make sure that we're holding ourselves to a standard around the embargoes. You know, mm -hmm. we're not going to embargo six months for our PR convenience. Yeah. We're going to keep it to the exact amount of time we need to prepare fixes for end users and get them delivered with testing. Right? Mm -hmm. We don't want to drop a bad patch that makes the problem worse. But beyond that, it, you know, researchers need to publish their stuff, mm -hmm. especially academics. Mm -hmm. Their future career as a PhD might depend on their publishing their findings. So, yeah. um, yep. so uh, um, we're getting close to time. So I'm going to ask um, sort of a final, a final wrapping question. Um, you know, seven, well, seven plus months later for you guys, and, and seven months later for most of us, and with some benefit of hindsight, perhaps not 2020, but. 2040, 2030, something, that's the wrong way, right, 2030? So with some hindsight, um, what would you guys have done differently? And, you know, what would be useful for someone else going through this? What possibly, I'll use the word mistakes were made, what would you have done differently? Um, had you have, if it starts again tomorrow, you know, what, what might change if you had to do the process again? So. Well, I don't know, man. I'm not ready for a sabbatical yet. But, um, <laughs> um, you guys want to field it first? Um, yeah, I'll start. Yeah. I think that the, there's been some subsequent variations of the Spectre and Meltdown that we've been able to collaborate on. And my experience pre-January 3rd and post-January 3rd, not night and day, but better dusk and dawn. Uh, so it's, we are collaborating much better now in things like having an authoritative list of who's read in, what they know, what we can share. Having this um, within the tent group has been extremely helpful. And having built these relationships over the last you know, half a year or more has been invaluable. And I know I can call Matt, or I can call Jorge, or I can call anyone on the team and have a good technical conversation and try to get some resolution on things. Yeah, for me, it, it would be get face to face earlier. Yeah. And and one of the things that would have helped us understand earlier, I think, is, and, and this sounds so dumb, but uh, how complex and interconnected the ecosystems were. Like a normal, we, we fix vulnerabilities all the time, and a normal vulnerability, even the really hard ones, is we fix a thing, then we release it to everybody all at the same time, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and I remember sitting in a meeting, you know, probably November, December time frame, and one of the other major cloud vendors said, so when can we test Windows Server with your patches? And, and it just had not occurred to me that, well, of course they're spinning a bunch of VMs with Windows Server and they're gonna have customers that ask, and well, of course we both know about this vulnerability. It's a very reasonable request, but it's not something I'd anticipated. It wasn't something that our processes had anticipated. Right, right. And so you're like, oh, well, let's go see if we can do that. Like, let's go figure out what it takes. And, you know, but it, you know, that kind of thing, I think 
if we'd started earlier with that kind of deep collaboration, we would have uncovered more of those things and, and made better use of the time that we had. Yeah, and potentially having done that you know, once, do you think that might be more, more likely in the future or sure. easier to do, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think the answer I'll give to this question is more of a predictive answer than a, a retroactive answer. Um, advice for, you know, future companies that have to do this sort of thing or, or future incident managers. I mentioned it is really all about communications. One of the things that I, I foresee being a problem and I'm always very aggressive about tamping down on is in order for industry collaborative multi-party vulnerability coordination to work, everybody really has to be operating with a point of view that this is a group effort kind of like for a, to prevent a tragedy of the commons, right? We're acting on behalf of all of our collective end users and all of the people that have dependencies on us. And, and to that effect, later after the, the fire has died down and the vuln was published long ago, you know, big companies have product people, big companies have sales and marketing, they're going to want to make themselves look great and you're going to start to find people, you know, writing slides about how they're awesome because they resolve this vulnerability really better than anyone, right? And you have to actively seek that out and say no. You know, part of the rules of a multi-party coordination around vulnerability sharing is after it's over, nobody throws shade. Right, nobody right. did it better, nobody fixed it sooner, nobody fixed it quicker because everybody is depending on each other to be open and honest and um, share their knowledge about things. And this sort of nascent sense of cooperation that I, I really love so much about fixing Spectre and Meltdown, it's something I want to nurture and nourish within the industry and the one thing I can see that would kill it off quicker than anything else is somebody making a press release about, you know, how they patched better or another company's patch failed qual or something, right? It really has to be, you know, you know what, we're in it together the whole time. No, so. you're here. Good. Yeah. All right. So um, I want to I want to thank everyone. Um, you know these these complicated multi-party disclosures are are always difficult. Uh, this one probably is a record setter, I would say, in, in my experience. Even though I wasn't, even though no one called me, <laughs> it still looks like it was a doozy. You, uh, you imagine it was very hard. I imagine it was very hard. And again, I, s s slight you know slight thank you for not calling me. <laughs> we had other stuff to do and all that. So Christmas. right. Yeah. Um, Inclusion is a double-edged sword, isn't it? It, it works yeah. both ways, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, you know, continuous improvements. I, I, I hope we can ride this wave of getting the higher bandwidth collaborations in sooner and bringing a few more people into the tent, even if the governments have to wait their turn a little longer. Um, but, yeah, th this is work towards improvement, and I hope this is useful to folks in the room to know what happened and, and, and gain some insights on what to do if this happens to you. Um, please join me, everyone, in, in thanking our panelists for their candor and their contributions here today. Thanks guys. Well done. Well done. Thanks guys.